Father, we thank you for watching over us. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us here safely and for the opportunity that we have in these summer months, in the middle of this pandemic, to be able to still come together and to worship you together and turn our hearts and our thoughts towards you together for the next hour. I pray, Lord, that you would guide us, you would guide our thinking, you would guide our hearts, you would speak to us, you would um, help us to receive from you what it is we need this day. May you hear from us worship in all that we do and all that we say in this next hour. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to search our hearts, that you would forgive us, Lord, for things that we've done that have missed the mark, things that we've done that have hurt you and hurt other people and hurt ourselves. And Lord, that you would forgive us for things that we failed to do that we really should have done. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness and for your grace and for your mercy. And I pray, and we come before you, Lord, in that grace and in that mercy, uh, wanting to hear from you, wanting to be in your presence, wanting to be surrounded by your love and to worship you. We just pray, Father, that you would have your hand upon everything we do and say. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. morning. We're going to start our time of worship together by um, speaking some words that will be on the screen. We're going to, uh, these words are, are to remind us of who we are and why we do what we do. Um, when we come together on a Sunday morning, sometimes we need to take that extra moment to just remind ourselves, this is who we are. And this is why we do the things that we do. So um, speak these words with me as we begin our time of worship together. We are his church, and we stand together. We are one body in one spirit, called to one hope under one Lord with one faith and one baptism for one Father of all. Once we were without, now we are within. Once divided, now unified. Once hostile, now reconciled. Once far away, now brought near. Once foreigners and strangers, now fellow citizens and family. Many parts, many gifts, many shapes and cultures, built on one foundation into one home for the spirit. And Christ himself is the cornerstone. We are his church and we stand together. Uh, I'm going to sing a song that I wrote a few years ago that's kind of on that theme, the idea that we are all united, that we stand together, that we look out for each other, that we support each other in his name. There are a couple of little passages in it, little choruses that may sound familiar. Uh, If you want to hum along with those, that's great. So um, it's called Here We Go Again. go again around the sun one more turning one more trip cause we that's you and me and our family tree we're sailing on this heavenly ship and there's room for us there's room for more there's room to grow and dance and roar. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. When you 
shed a tear. Sorrow or fear, my hand will reach, take hold of yours. And when I miss a step and you see me slip, you'll reach and pull me back on board. And there's time for us, there's time for more, there's time to grow and dance and roar. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Round and round, but always straight ahead. We're in this boat together, like the captain said. Some days we will be standing side by side. Some days we will be dancing hip to hip to hip to hip. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life an atonement for sin. And opened the life gates that all may go in. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Read to you from Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for, gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? <clears throat> shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your spirit makes it alive and speaks to, it, to us through your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would do that this morning, that we would come away from this place um, just even more certain of your love for us, even more certain of how real you are, even more certain of how much you want to be involved in our lives. Please take these words and use them, Lord by your spirit to touch our hearts. Please give me the strength to do this. And please take this time, Lord, it's yours. Do anything you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So this passage from Romans 8 came to my attention this week, and I thought, I think I'd really like to, to speak on it. And then I realized that I spoke on it last fall. And, um, but I felt that the main points would still bear repeating today. 
as we face many areas of difficulty and upheaval in our lives over the last number of months. So the last, main point of last week's message is that we cannot go anywhere where God's spirit is not. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I hide from your presence? No matter where we go, no matter what we face in life, we are never beyond the reach of the spirit of God who desires to intervene in our lives and to give us the strength and the power and the peace that we need. And this passage kind of goes along the same lines. Nothing can separate us from God's love. There are those of us in our church family, probably all of us, who need to know, need to be reassured that they are surrounded by God's spirit and never separated from his love. Gary in the hospital in Toronto needs to know that. Sandy, who buried her husband on Friday and is beginning this journey of grief, needs to know that God's spirit of comfort is surrounding her and that nothing can separate her from God's love. There are those among us who are struggling with their health. Some are recovering from surgery. Some have parents who aren't well and are getting more and more sick. Some are experiencing changes within their families as young adults leave and begin to set out on their own. Some of us might be struggling financially or spiritually or emotionally. We all need to know that God's spirit is always near and that nothing can separate us from God's love. And over and above the various trials that, we're in that, that face our lives under normal circumstances, we're all dealing with the impact of the pandemic on our lives. Some have been impacted financially and are struggling to work through that. Some have had medical issues delayed and put off and are dealing with the stress of wondering when they're going to have their procedure done. We've all had to adjust to a world that has changed in the last four months. We've had to deal with the loneliness of not being able to visit family and friends. We've dealt with major changes in our work environments. We've struggled with inactivity and the impact and the pounds that it puts on our lives. We've missed being together at church. And even though we can now be together, we miss elements of our being together that we'd normally really enjoy, but we're still not able to do yet. And even beyond Sunday mornings, we as a church have been impacted. Our attempts at doing online Bible studies met with mixed results. Ideas we've had for ministry had to be shelved or, or, or put on hold. Our youth group and our moms group haven't met at all for almost five months. But through it all, we need to remind ourselves of this truth. God's spirit is still living and active. We cannot be anywhere where his spirit is not. And nothing can separate us from his unfailing love. A love that I think we all need to sense, perhaps more than ever. In verse 35 in our passage from Romans, Paul asks the rhetorical question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he then goes on to list a number of possibilities, a number of answers to his rhetorical question, all situations that we might face in our lives today. Shall trouble separate us from the love of Christ, Paul asks. Now, the word translated trouble literally means pressure or compression. The pressures of life can weigh us down. They can be burdens on our hearts and souls and minds. We can feel the pressure of affliction. An illness can strike us or strike someone we love with alarming suddenness, leaving our minds just spinning, wondering how could God's love possibly be a part of this. Traumatic circumstances can leave us in distress. We may lose our job. Someone close to us might pass away. The pressures of job and family and school and many other responsibilities can just become too much to bear. People can sometimes be the source of our trouble. Tensions at home may build up until it's just ready to explode. Someone at work may be absolutely driving you nuts. And you know you can't take much more, but you know you can't quit because you need to pay the paycheck. The last, the last four months of living under the pandemic we have exasperated all of these pressures that we face in our lives. And they've added their own share of new ones. We all have pressures and afflictions and distresses and troubles in our lives. 
displaying themselves in varying ways and in varying degrees. And these troubles are burdensome and they can lead to difficulty and suffering. But shall trouble separate us from the love of Christ? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Shall hardship separate us from the love of Christ? The word literally means narrowness of place. It's closely connect, connected to the previous word in that the pressures and afflictions and troubles in life can, can kind of paint us in a corner. Life in a pandemic has made our world very small in, some, in many ways. For some of us, we've been able to embrace technology that has helped us stay connected in some ways, but, but on balance, our world has become smaller as, as we've put off travel, as we've stopped visiting people, as our daily routine has been upset. Seniors and people living in long-term care homes and people living alone have perhaps felt this more than most. An already small world has become even smaller. Over our lifetime, we face illness and death, unemployment, family tensions, emotional trauma. We can feel our world closing in around us, if not even crumbling down around us. Our circumstances have put us in a tight situation, and we don't have a whole lot of wiggle room. We don't know where to turn. In fact, sometimes even if we did know where to turn, we don't, we'd even have the strength to get there. Hardship can produce anguish as we feel we're boxed in by circumstances beyond our control. But shall hardship separate us from the love of Christ? No. In all this, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Shall persecution separate us from the love of Christ? Being a Christian in affluent, secular North American society isn't always easy. Laws are passed by our governments and the general moral direction of society are making it increasingly difficult to, to run our lives and raise our families according to Christian principles completely unhindered. However, however most Canadians are, are tolerant of people of faith. And we as Christians can own beautiful church buildings and, and worship in freedom. We have no idea what it's like for our brothers and sisters in far off countries who literally have to run for their lives as mobs of Muslim extremists descend upon their ch church building and torch it to the ground. There have been some who have looked at the restrictions placed on us by health authorities because of the pandemic, especially the restrictions placed on churches, and they've chalked that up to some form of persecution. And it's true that we do always have to be vigilant in our society that our religious freedom remains intact. But in reality, we have no idea what real persecution is like. We have no idea what it's like to have to meet under the cover of darkness in cramped homes so as not to be heard by the government officials, the police, or suspicious neighbors. We have no idea what it's like for police to burst into a church service and grab our pastor away. Jeff Jacoby is a syndicated columnist for the Boston Globe, and he writes this. For millions of Christians in other lands, fear is ever present. Never before have so many believers in Jesus been persecuted for their faith. Wherever militant Islam has taken hold and wherever communist dictators still rule, Christians are in desperate danger. Yet persecution does not kill the church. In fact, it often has the opposite effect. Today, despite years of persecution, there are, by conservative estimates, over 50 million believers in communist China. But shall persecution separate us from the love of God? No. In all this, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Shall famine or nakedness separate us from the love of Christ? Some of us have faced financial hardship because of the pandemic. As a Canadian society as a whole, we'll be dealing for years with the debt that we've had to incur because of our desire to help those most affected by the pandemic. As we muddle through in today's economy, our standard of living isn't always what it once was. For some, that might mean just trimming the budget a bit and cutting back here and there. For others, it means an empty fridge living paycheck to paycheck, trying to juggle all the bills in order to keep the hydro on and the phone working. 
And for some, things just totally fall apart. And people who used to donate to the Fair Share Food Bank now go to the United Church to use it. But shall famine or nakedness separate us from the love of Christ? No. In all this, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Shall danger separate us from the love of Christ? Over the last four months, I think all of our lives have been more attuned to danger around us. We see danger everywhere. I was walking up uh, Augusta Street yesterday to come over to the church, and some fellow was walking in the opposite direction, and, and he just instinctively walked out into the street because we, we see people coming towards us, and we want to stay six feet away from each other because of the potential danger. We, over the last months, have not gone to a restaurant, not gone to the theater, not gone to a ball game, all for fear of the danger that might be there. We are all told to wear masks to protect each other from potential danger. Even though the World Health Organization says it's not necessary, my sister still wipes down all the groceries that get delivered to her house for fear of passing anything on to my aging parents. Living with this sense of danger is wearying and it's confusing as we wrestle with what are the rules and what are we supposed to do and what don't we have to do. But it is very real, as I found out this week, as one of my friends in Ohio was diagnosed positive with COVID-19. But shall danger separate us from the love of Christ? No. In all this, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Shall sword separate us from the love of Christ? Here Paul's using a figure of speech called metonymy. And we see this in the news reports whenever the newscaster comes on and says, Ottawa announced today that blah, 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 blah. And he's not saying the entire population of Ottawa, all 1.2 million, stood up and all shouted the same thing all at once. He's using the word Ottawa to stand for the federal government, that they've made an important announcement. And so it is in this passage that sword stands for something broader. One dictionary defined it as ordinary violence or dissensions that destroy peace. Sword can be dissensions within a family. The disagreements and the arguments and the tensions that destroy peace and threaten to un unravel the very fabric of the home. Sword can be the dissensions that divide a church family as brothers and sisters who once worshiped together are divided into warring factions over very trivial things at times. Sword can be actual physical violence where the, the sense of danger we talked about becomes a reality and innocent victims are created that are scarred for life. Sword can be violence to the point of death. Verse 36 in our Romans passage quotes a verse from Psalm 44, which is a plea for God to help in a time of distress. It says, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Sword is the ultimate persecution. And on top of wrestling with COVID the last couple of months, our society, and especially in the United States, is wrestling with sword, with violence that destroys peace. Protests demanding justice in the face of horrible violence have themselves become violent in a number of cities. And people see the chaos and they don't know where to turn. And the last couple of months have uncovered deep dissensions in society, dissensions that were always there but now have been brought out into the open and magnified, dissensions that are causing arguments and conflicts and even violence, dissensions that need to be healed. Yet we have so few in society that are standing up with solutions for this healing that everybody can agree on. But Shall the sword separate us from the love of Christ? No. In all this, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, Paul is wanting to get his point across to the Roman believers about the position of the Christian in the face of all these afflictions. And he could have said, we have overcome. Or he could have said that the believer comes out on top. He could have said, we are victorious but he knew that wasn't enough. It wouldn't have given the true picture of the victory the believer enjoys over the afflictions and distresses of life because of the love of Christ. So, Paul, in his wisdom, 
basically made up a word. He uses a word that doesn't appear anywhere else in the original language of the New Testament, and it means to be a super conqueror, an ultra conqueror, a mega conqueror. It means to keep on being conquerors to a greater degree, to keep on winning a glorious victory. It's funny that all these things that Paul lists, which are meant to bring us defeat and to bring us down and to separate us from God's love, actually end up being used by God to bring us victory, a victory that surpasses anything we know and to make us even more sure of God's love for us. Bob was sharing before whether he wasn't sure if what he was sharing was an up or a down. Well, it doesn't really matter because in either situation, God's love works in those situations. It becomes more real to us. That which was meant to cause a breach between us and God can actually bring us close. We can be sure that as we face trouble and hardship and persecution and famine and nakedness and danger and sword in our lives, we can be sure that even in the middle of the impact the changes in the world are having on your life, you can know that God will take what was meant for our defeat, what was meant to bring us down, and will use it to lift us up. We'll use it for our good. We'll use it to fulfill his purpose for our lives. We'll use it to make us more like Christ. We'll use it to give us a victory that goes beyond our wildest imaginations and to ensure and assure us that nothing can separate us from his love. For I am convinced, Paul says in verse 38, he doesn't say, well, I'm pretty sure about this, or this is what I've heard, this is the scuttlebutt, or this seems to be the way it works. No, he says, I'm convinced. I'm persuaded. He has lived what he writes about. He has experienced hardship. He's experienced persecution and danger. And he's found the love of Christ to be even more real and even more close. And that through it, he has conquered. He has super conquered. Sometimes we have to go through the storms in life before we're truly convinced of God's unfailing love for us. And when we look at our present struggles as opportunities to we look at our present struggles as opportunities to have the certainty of Christ's love for us embedded in our hearts. When we do that, then maybe we won't see them as objects of fear or danger or dread, but rather as times to draw near to God, of seeing a loving God become more real in our lives and become more active in our lives. To further demonstrate his conviction, Paul uses a series of, of extremes to portray to us his utter persuasion that nothing can separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, God's love for us transcends mortal existence. It goes beyond the boundaries of our known world. God's love is eternal. For the believer, we are in the eternal presence of God already. We are in the very center of his love, whether we are experiencing life or death. Neither angels nor demons, both are of a higher created order than humans, but both were created just the same. And no created being, no matter how powerful they are, can separate us from God's love. Neither the present nor the future. God's love for us transcends time. God is in the eternal now. Hardships known now, unknown distresses to come, they cannot change God's love towards us. God's love transcends both supernatural powers and the powers of earthly governments. God's love for us transcends space and everything in the created realm. There is nothing in time or space, nothing in earthly or heavenly creation that can separate us from the love that God has for us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing, absolutely nothing. The past four months have tested us all in different ways. They've upset our way of life and perhaps even tested our faith. As a believer, as we endure hardships and distresses in life, know that they are, they are not a sign that God's love for you has somehow waned and is somehow lessened. They're not a sign that his love for you has somehow changed as much as the enemy of your soul would love to convince you that that's the case. On the contrary, God's love is with you through it all so that you can be a super conqueror in all of these situations. 
And that's because nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of Christ. Through all the uncertainties we have faced in recent months, of this we can be certain. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Would you pray with me, please? With our heads bowed and eyes closed in this silence before God, which is an act of worship, just before him, listening to what he has to say. Maybe these last four months have been really rough on you. Maybe these last couple of weeks have been really rough. And you need that reassurance of God's incredible love for you. Take a moment in his presence. Let him love you. Let him remind you of just how much he loves you and that love will never end. Take a moment to make this message personal in your life. And in this world where someone's worth is based on what someone will pay, it's nice to know, Lord, I'm worth one Jesus to you. Thank you, Lord, that you so love the world that you gave your only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And that you've come to give us life, not just life eternal, but life abundant now. that through your love we can become super conquerors in you. It doesn't mean trouble's not going to hit our lives. But we know that we can walk with it through, with you and through your love. Lord, I pray that this, now and through this week, that you would give us just an increased sense of your love for us that we would see that in all kinds of different situations, like Carol shared in her life before. I pray, Lord, that even in unexpected ways, Lord, that you, by your grace and mercy, would show us your love, remind us of how much you love us. Help us, Lord, to continually look to you, look to the cross, and realize the love that is there. And Father, as, as we face different difficulties and, and uh, trials in our lives and, and loaded on top of that is the pandemic and, and other issues that are, this world is facing, where we can be tempted to feel forgotten or painted into a corner or weighed down, I pray, Lord, that you would just flood our lives with your love that even in the midst of difficult situations, our hearts would be lifted up, that we would know your love in a supernatural way, and we, and we would sense your love as well coming from our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we thank you for that reassurance of your word, that nothing can separate us from your love. Give us what we need, Lord, to be able to walk in that love this day. And this week, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. So glad you could be with us today. All right, everybody, mask up. Helen's beat me to it already. She's, she's ready to go. Let's stand together. This week, may God bless you. May you have an increased sense. You've, most of you have already known this for many, many years. You're familiar with this passage. Like I said, I preached on it last fall as well. But we need to be reminded so many more times, especially with what we're all facing now, that nothing can separate us from God's love. And may that become so real to you this week. God bless you.